Hello everyone, my name is Eric Jones, better known as the Turf Teacher. Welcome to the course entitled Bidding, Estimating, and Project Pricing. This information comes not only from the North Carolina Landscape Contractors Guide to Business Law and Project Management, but also the textbook by David Sauter entitled Landscape Construction, which is another manual that is used in the pre-licensing course to become a landscape contractor. And those are three, well there's actually two that I'm talking about here, but there's three textbooks that is recommended by the North Carolina Landscape Contractors Licensing Board, and we're using two of those uh, in this lecture here. The bidding and estimating comes directly from the NASCLA book, and then the project pricing comes from the David Sauter book. And so guys, this is some really good information because no matter how experienced you are, how many years you've been in business, there's always issues with bidding, estimating, and what does the project actually cost me? And now that we're bidding on some of these newer companies that all of a sudden become a landscaper overnight uh, that are that are doing maybe some unethical things uh, when it comes to bidding on jobs and estimating them and 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 we see this all the time with with licensed uh, general contractors uh, some of the things that they do to get the pricing uh, where they need it to be so anyway let's go ahead and get started with our objectives and we're going to discuss bid documents so what are bid documents bid documents are going to be the documents that are included in your pre-bid construction meeting. You're going to see a sample of the contract. You're going to see um, an example of a change order. You're going to get any addendum that's been approved uh, prior to the bids going out. So the difference between an addendum and a change order, the addendum happens uh, before bids have been awarded. Changes in the design. Change orders are changes in the design after the uh, contracts have been awarded. So you, you'll see samples of that. You'll see uh, examples of a bid bond, uh, more than likely. You'll see um, a list of insurance or additional insurance that you may need. You'll see examples of the payment application and the payment schedules uh, that will happen during the, uh, the whole construction uh, process. And this is probably going to take place more on a large uh, commercial landscape installation versus a residential. But you never know because a lot of landscape architects are practicing construction management services and so they may be the ones that issue the payments or at least qualify you to get the payment after they do their inspections. Um, but ethics and bidding, guys, we see it every single day. Uh, even in the residential side, you know, we got a lot of new people coming out and you got a lot of homeowners that may be house broke uh, that are kind of shopping some of these bids and it's not... Uh, you know, it's not illegal, but is it, is, it, is it ethical? Probably not. Then we're going to talk about uh, estimate planning and then determining your estimated cost and then other methods of estimating. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are already using some type of job costing software and, you know, most everybody is familiar with QuickBooks or using QuickBooks. And then there's the other uh, resources out there, you know, Jobber, LMN software, uh, Lawn Buddy, all kinds of um, pricing software and scheduling software that can help you uh, do your um, your bidding and your estimating. We're going to talk about estimating pitfalls. We're going to talk about using an estimator. Some of you guys may already have an estimator on staff or you being the, uh, the entrepreneur or the business owner may want to do that yourself. We're going to talk about submitting your bid and then we're going to talk about job cost uh, recording systems. And then last but not least, some technology tools uh, for estimating. And like I said, there's a lot, lot of estimating uh, tools out there. You know, in today's world, I mean, really all you need is a cell phone uh, to complete these estimates because a lot of these software programs run on apps. So you can have a tablet or you can have your cell phone out there. And, and guys, you're, you're pretty much estimating and scheduling your jobs uh, within the field. So with bidding and estimating, accurate estimating is important to the profitability of a landscape construction company. And that's true. And guys, not only landscape construction, but landscape management, lawn care, mowing, the whole nine yards. If you're not making a profit, why are you in business? But guys, I see a lot of these youngsters getting in business and it's like a competition. And I'm seeing bids submitted so low because they just want to get the job over their buddies or over their competitors. I wouldn't necessarily call them their buddies, but they're in, they're in such competition like, hey, I'm going to get that job from you. And just last year, you know, I was standing at the Green and Grow show with my dad 
And he was sitting there talking to one of his, you know, colleagues that he's known for quite some time. And they were discussing other contractors and they were talking about uh, submitting bids on some properties. That, you know, the one guy he was talking to does, does a lot of commercial uh, apartments and just doing the maintenance on them. And another individual walked by. And, uh, you know, my dad knew him, you know, kind of said, hey, and stuff. But as he walked off, um, the individual that dad was talking to for quite a while, he says, man, I will, I'll, I'll underbid that guy by, by submitting a price for zero if it meant just getting the work from him. He's like, I hate him that much that I would do all of his properties for free just to see him go under. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm like, and I asked him this question. I said, well, if, if you do the jobs for free, aren't you going to go out of business too? Wouldn't, you, wouldn't your business fail? I don't care. I mean, if it just meant putting him out of business, that's all. Of, and see, there's a lot of that competition going around, guys. I don't compete with nobody. You know, if I lose a job, you know, it's not gonna, it's, it's not going to be by price. I, I'm going to lose the job uh, because people just don't feel comfortable with me. If I'm bidding against you, the one watching this lecture, we're both licensed landscape contractors. We should be on we should be on the same platform. To be honest with you, we have the same expenses, we have the same insurance, we have the same everything. You know, so if I lose a job to you, it's because you just connected better with that customer. And, and the odds are that we're going to probably be within just a, a few hundred, a couple hundred dollars on a multi-thousand dollar project, to be honest with you, because we're buying from the same nursery. We're buying from the same uh, supply houses. Everything is the same when you're on this playing level that we are. So guys, you are my colleagues, not my competitors. The estimator must ask these questions when assass uh, assessing uh, where to bid on a project. Does our company have the resources to perform this type of work? Well, think about it. If you're a lawn maintenance contractor that's wanting to get into commercial landscape installation, do you have everything that you need to have? Probably not. You know, you can't go do a large installation job if you've only got one truck, one trailer, and two mowers on it. You need to kind of stay away from that. But what I'm seeing, I'm seeing these guys take it on, they're renting the equipment, they're pulling in their buddies, they're trying to act a little bit bigger than they are. I don't like that, guys. I'm gonna focus on one thing, one thing only, and perfect it because what? Monotonous work makes money. And if you're doing the same thing over and over, like mowing, perfect it, and then jump in to commercial landscape installation. You can't do it all when you're just getting started, but we're seeing it happen. So do you have those resources? Maybe, maybe not. Are there any special site considerations that we need to consider? Well, is it, well, for one, is it, is it within our area of practice or, or area, uh, area of the, the general facility of where we work? Or is it 50 miles down the road? Or what about any other site conditions or site considerations? Is it, is it on a hill? Is it a very steep property where they're, where they're um, building it? Do we have that equipment to do that type of work? No, then you stay away from it. If yes, think about it. The estimator must ask these other questions. How can we do the work efficiently and in the most cost effective manner? Well, guys, if it's an out of state job, you know that you're going to be probably spending the night in a hotel and you're going to be working late hours and there's nothing wrong with that. And I would rather actually go and do a job out of town, staying in a hotel close by than to drive 50, 60 miles a day to and from the job site. Because there are a lot of people that do that. What are the risks and how will you manage them? Are you insured? Do you have enough insurance to, to cover the job? Well, you may only have $500,000 general liability. They may be requiring that you have at least $2 million. You need to up that insurance. And what is your profit margin on this work? Well, and that's gonna depend, guys. I mean, if you've got the equipment to do it, if you're set up to do it, if your crew is used to doing it, that's how you can make a profit on it. You can't take, a bunch of rookies with you and do one of these out of town jobs or one of these larger commercial projects if you hadn't done it before or had employees that's used to doing it. You can't just start overnight, but a lot of people do. You're seeing it just like I am. So in a competitive bid situation, 
a bid package is often put together that includes an invitation to bid, and we get them all the time. We used to get more uh, than we did because we kind of slowed down that uh, installation work that we did. We kind of got hooked up with the O'Reilly's Auto Parts and was traveling with them, so we didn't really bid on some of the other stuff. But a lot of the large local general contractors or commercial builders here in the triad we got invitations to bid all the time. Back in the old days when they had fax machines, they would come in all the time. Invitation to bid on a Burger King, invitation to bid on um, you know, a new state employees credit union. All of that came in all the time. There's bid instructions, and that's gonna tell you when to bid it, how to bid it, where they need to be submitted to, that they need to be mailed in prior to a certain date. Can you fax them in? And a lot of times, like with the O'Reilly's, we had to have them in by Friday at noon because O'Reilly's would have to submit their stuff by two o'clock to O'Reilly's uh, um, corporate office to see if they actually got um, you know, got the uh, auto parts store. And they got several of them. You know, they didn't get awarded all of them. And then we didn't get awarded all of the landscape jobs were. It just kind of depends. And, you know, to be honest with you, when they're doing 10 at a time, we, we couldn't focus, um, but maybe on two or three. So they had to have other landscape uh, contractors doing it. You're going to see examples of the bid forms uh, on how to do it. Um, you're going to see like the chain, co you know, a copy of a change order, an example of it. You're going to see supplements that's included in the contract. And then the addendum, changes that are made before the design um, before it is due. So the landscape architect maybe had to make some changes. Maybe they couldn't, you know, find any plant material or maybe the, the homeowner or, or, or um, property manager come to them and said, Hey, you know, we don't like red crack myrtles. We want to go with uh, a pink one. So they had to make that change. And you know, yeah, that's not really going to affect cost, but other changes like that may affect it. And so you want to see the original design and then you want to see those changes that were made uh, just to kind of bring you up to date on where the owner's thinking and what's going on with the project. Ethics in bidding. Now, this is a funny one. Good ethical conduct is necessary to maintain the integrity of the bidding process. And if you guys, if you read the North Carolina Landscape Contractors uh, Code, the code that we're supposed to follow by, we need to conduct ourselves in a professional manner. And this is a prime example of not um, carrying on in a um, professional manner. Some examples of bad ethical conduct include bid shopping. Now, bid shopping happens when a uh, landscape or a general contractor will approach subcontractors um, that maybe didn't necessarily win the uh, award and say, hey, can you, uh, can you do this for a little bit cheaper? And we know that our residential clients do this all the time. You know, you submit the bid and your, your bid is laid out to the T. You've got everything laid out. You've got a nice little contract there. And the homeowner may actually take that and shop it out with somebody else and say, hey, you know, what can you do this? Do this right. Can you do this for this price right here? You know, they're not going to get the same quality of job. They're never. They never will. Um, and so let them do it, guys. They're probably going to end up calling you back nine times out of ten to fix the mistakes. Then there's bid peddling. This occurs when the subcontractor approaches the GC and uh, wants to lower the original bid price that somebody else has submitted. So we know so and so got this job for five thousand dollars. Well, you know, we can we can come in and do it for for four thousand dollars. Heck, I've actually seen it done half. You know, they will submit a bid or or try to get the job doing it for half of what we priced it on. And we know they can't even cover the cost of materials to do the job, but they're doing it. And then bid rigging is when some uh contractors kind of go in together and um talk about it beforehand and kind of actually set it up who's going to win the bid so they work they work together on it so guys all of that is unethical but it happens all the time it, it's just one of those things and, and and back to that bid shopping it, it just drives me crazy especially when it comes to working for a homeowners association and i can't tell you the times that uh, we've been somewhere brought the property to outstanding uh looks i mean just made it phenomenal looking and then all of a sudden, you know, you hear this, my nephew started a mowing business. So we think we're going to let him try it next year. 
And, and that just drives me absolutely crazy. So you know what they're doing? They're getting it done cheaper. They're like, hey, nephew, can you do it for this price right here? They're shopping it out. So estimate planning. Once you've determined that you want to submit a bid, you must prepare your estimate. An estimate is the sum of the cost to complete the project plus your added overhead and profit margin. Now, what is your overhead? Most of you guys already know what your daily overhead is. You know, you've got office staff, you've got uh, shop fees or, or, or rent on the shop or a mortgage on it. All of these are considered overhead. So you probably know your overhead per hour, what, what, what it's costing you to just be in business per hour before you go out and do any work. Most of you know that and you should. And then kind of see what kind of profit margins you want to make on this job. You know, I hear contractors all the time saying they're working on 1% margin. And I'm like, why? Why would you even want to be in business? Even if you're doing a million dollars a year in business, that still ain't worth it when it comes to all those headaches. I'd rather be a lot smaller and have a higher profit margin uh, than, than doing that. So project documents should include your construction or architectural details or drawings. Uh, they're probably gonna be in a CAD. They're gonna be on 24 by 36 sheet of paper more than likely. You may have a chance to get them emailed to you prior to the bid, uh, or you may have to go and pick a copy of them up. And, and most all the time, you're gonna have to purchase the plans. They want you to bid on it, but you're gonna have to pay for a set of the documents to do it. And then the specifications. Of course, you need to get a copy of those specifications and the builders don't like giving that to you. You need to ask for it most of the time. And I like actually when these drawings are at, at a blueprint store or one of the, uh, one of the, the repro graphics place where you can actually go in and they'll run you a copy of the plans and because you can say, hey, can I get, can I see the spec book or can I get a copy of the spec book? And you purchase that as well because you need to see what's in those specifications. Too many nightmare stories out there, guys. You're gonna see uh, a sample of a contract and what it's gonna look like. So it'll give you a chance to read through it and kind of see what they're expecting and what you should expect from them. And then you're gonna see copies of the bonds that they uh, may want you to have. Yes, we already have our uh, surety bond as a landscape contractor and irrigation contractor, but they may want you to get a bid bond. So you may have to submit a bid bond and that's gonna actually protect the owner that if you are the award-winning contractor, and that means you're the low bid more than likely, and then you decide and say, whoa, I can't do this you've just forfeited your bid bond or your deposit that you have to put down. Sometimes they'll accept, you know, um, you know, a percentage of what they think the rough cost is going to be. And you can give a check for that, or you can submit a bid bond. But if you do not do the project or walk away from it, they'll enact that bid bond and they'll get their money uh, to actually use that money and go to the next higher level contractor because they'd kind of planned on your cheapness to do the, uh, the project. Uh, there may be specifics about the site that influence the cost estimate. So, guys, you got to do a call. You got to do a site visit. But I know a lot of you. You know, if you're bidding on work out of town, it's kind of hard to do it. But you know, maybe Google Earth, you can do it. You know, if you can find out what county it's in, the municipality, you could probably do uh, look at their GIS or, or geodata system if they if they have one. Uh, but estimating should be a systematic process. Define the phases of the project and then list each task and materials needed for each phase. Now, of course, we're doing the same thing over and over again. We should know that the larger trees go in first, then the shrubs, then the turf grass, then you want to mulch. So a lot of that, and some, you know, some of you may mulch uh, uh, prior to turf grass. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of up to you, but you need to know what you're doing and you need to know the task involved with each you need to think about which other subcontractors may be involved at that stage of the construction project because nine times out of 10, when you go to the commercial installation site, there's gonna be subcontractors parked all over the road. Some of them are parked in the yard. I mean, they're, they're trying to get that certificate of occupancy so everybody is there finishing up their work and then we're trying to get in there just to get started. So guys, you gotta kinda plan for this you got to um, 
you just got to be a little experienced when it comes to the commercial installations. It's even bad on residentials working for a home builder, guys. Everybody there at the last. So determine your cost. Determine your labor cost for each task. What is the required labor hours per task times your labor rate? And then your labor cost, uh, that's going to equal your labor cost per task. Now, you might ask what, what is a good hourly billable rate and it's different for each job guys i mean you know i've always said that you're breaking even if you're charging 50 bucks an hour i mean that barely covers your cost on a mowing crew so your guys need to be producing more than 50 bucks an hour and if you got a two-man crew that's a hundred bucks an hour and that's just your cost basically when you think about all your taxes your insurance the, the wages for your uh, employees, your unemployment tax, your social security tax, all that, plus your fuel, plus the wear and tear on your machines, the travel time that you're not actually cutting yards. So I'm thinking 50 plus maybe just your break even point. Now, it may be more or less on a construction site because on a construction site, you're gonna be there all day long you're not having to worry about travel time. Yes, you're still worried about fuel and the taxes and everything, but only you can really determine that. And I've heard labor you know, rates, guys, I mean, spread across numerous numbers. Like, I've even, you know, and it's kind of embarrassing, but I hear this in some of my seminars that, that some guys are only charging, you know, 20 bucks an hour. And then, you know, I got guys that are charging, you know, starting at 80 an hour. So, I mean, that's a big, wide range, you know? I like it at 80 bucks an hour. I like it even more. Sometimes guys, it really, you know, sometimes we need to be, just think about plumbers and electricians. You know, they're getting, you know, 100, 120 an hour the first hour that they're working. And then it may drop down to like 90 bucks an hour. But what's the difference in them and us? We got a whole lot more equipment than they have to work with. They've got a van with some parts on it. We've got, you know, diesel dump trucks and, and, and uh, four door trucks with skid steers and, and rock rakes on it and tractors. You know, we have a lot more overhead than the plumbers and electricians and they're charging that 120. The problem is we've, we've done it to ourselves. And my dad's always said this. He said, you know, from day one, you know, he's been in business since 77. He worked for a, a nursery a landscape guy for 10 years prior to starting his own business. And he says, we've, we've kind of set ourselves up as being the unprofessional or unlicensed individual until here recently, since we've got a landscape contractor uh, license law, but we've done it to ourselves and we have nobody to blame but ourselves. And we're the only ones that can drive those rates up in the public's eye and we got to educate these young guys and gals coming into business uh, than what it is but look at our labor burden here medicare social security federal unemployment insurance what is that federal un eric i pay all my guys underneath the table well try that see how far you get with that when the irs knocks on the door workers comp workers comp Eric, I ain't got but one other employee myself. I ain't supposed to have it unless I have three or more employees. Wait till one of them gets hurt, man. Liability insurance. State unemployment insurance. Company benefits. I don't give no benefits to my guys. My God, I can't find nobody to work. Well, what are you paying them an hour? I start them out at eight, nine dollars an hour. Well, no wonder they're not working for you guys. And if you are paying somebody seven fifty eight dollars bucks an hour, maybe you can get by with $20 an hour labor rate if you're paying them under the table and you're not paying workers' comp and you're not having to do all this unemployment insurance. Well, maybe you can get by with it. The problem is, guys, we're always going to have to deal with these individuals out there. And people always ask me about the license. Well, how can we police the licensing? Guys, I'm not so much worried about the license as I am competing with guys like this. No wonder they can do it a whole lot cheaper. So when we're promoting that we're licensed landscape contractors, we need to tell these residential homeowners that we're also taking care of this for our employees, Medicare, Social Security, unemployment insurance, and we provide them health insurance. We provide them a life insurance policy. This is a career. 
They're working in a career, not a job that they get paid daily because they can't do anything else. We need to set our standards a lot higher and we got to hold ourselves accountable for it. So determine materials costs, the price per unit times the number of units needed. You know, same thing, you know, sod. If you're laying a tractor and trailer load of sod, how many rolls or how many cubes or squares is on a pallet? What is the cost per pallet? And how long does it take you to put that out? If you've put out a bunch of sod, you know that cost. And you know, early morning, they're gonna, that stuff's gonna come off pretty quick. But as the day goes along, that sod laying gets a little bit slower. Determine project equipment cost. You know, if you own the equipment, uh, you can arrive at a unit cost for the equipment. Calculated by estimating the number of hours you will use the equipment per year. Dividing this number by the total yearly cost of equipment calculated by considering operational factors. So you know what it's going to cost you per hour to own that machine for the entire year. Yes. So when you figure that out, you need to know what you need to be making per hour on the equipment plus the man hour or the person driving the machine, using and operating the machine, that's got to be covered as well. Rental equipment considerations, equipment and rental rate, the labor cost to pick it up and return it, and then the labor cost to operate the equipment and, you know, the fuel that you've got to spend on it. Most of the time they're going to deliver the equipment for you, um, you know, if, you've, if you're working with a rental company, or it may be quicker for you to go and get it if you're needed in a, in a timely manner. Sometimes you may have to wait if they're going to deliver it, but again, this can be uh, figured pretty quick. You know, we rent a lift to do a lot of Christmas lights. You know, we know exactly what it costs us per week. So we know what it costs us per hour and we got the man in it. We try to use that lift every, every billable hour uh, during the week we're installing and taking down Christmas lights. Subcontractor fees, if you're having to use any. What about allowances? Finished materials such as uh, carpeting, fixtures, lighting. If we're gonna have to put some landscape lighting in, what is that allowance for that? Of course, people's eyes is always bigger than their wallets. Mom and dad used to say that when we go out to eat, said them eyes bigger than that stomach. Uh, Cause all that food looked good going through the K and W line, but uh, we couldn't we couldn't eat all every everything that we got. Same thing with people when it comes to to this. I don't like having allowances like that. I'd rather go ahead and price um, something because it's always hard especially like in home building, you know, you give them a, uh, a plumbing fixture allowance. And of course they're going to go to the showroom and I've seen women pick out a kitchen faucet that's more than your total allowance for plumbing fixtures. So it's kind of ridiculous <laughs> when it comes to that. So basically the only time it's going to affect us is if we're doing some landscape lighting fixtures or if we're doing, you know, maybe outdoor kitchen uh, fixtures, you know, the, you know, grill, stove, things of that nature. So there may be allowances uh, on a project like that. But hopefully it's specced out by the landscape architect. Uh, step seven, add contingencies. Sometimes added to the project uh, to protect a contractor if an unanticipated problem occurs. Guys, what about rain? It rains for two weeks straight. Project overhead, bonds, temporary storage, a temporary office if needed, security guard, utilities, dumpsters. What about porta potties? All that is job or project overhead. And yes, we're going to be associated, you know, or having to deal with bonds. We're probably not going to have to worry about temporary storage or an office, and definitely not a security guard. But we're definitely going to have to work. We may have to have temporary power on a job if we're going to be there any length of time. And we may have to have dumpsters and porta potties, especially if we're doing a large outdoor hardscape or, or, or outdoor kitchen. Add company overhead, office rent, accounting fees, taxes, telephone, legal fees, administrative labor. Overhead percentages generally average between 5 and 20%. So just think of it, 20% of of your total um, cost is 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 company overhead. You got to spend money to make money. 
And a lot of people don't like having all that overhead. And you know, they want to they want to run their business out of their house. That's perfectly okay. Uh, they don't want to hire that secretary. I think that secretary is one of the most important things you can have in a landscape company. Somebody that's good with customers. It's got that good personal voice. Uh, on the phone when somebody calls in or they have that email etiquette where they can return these emails and and kind of put out fires for you um, you need to you need to have that individual and they need to 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 be a part of it and you know a friend of mine um, uh, came to my seminars last weekend uh, in january uh, january eighteenth he lost his uh, he lost his uh you know his secretary his administrative gal she's 44 44 years old and uh, she passed away w with a heart attack at 44 and she knew everything about his business and he's like i don't know what i'm gonna do without her he said i mean he called me you know and it, this was a hard time for him and and he said eric i do not know what i'm going to do and when he came to my seminar uh you know last weekend he's like uh eric you know, I've hired somebody and he said, I honestly think the, the gal that left me, she's still looking after me because she, she, I think, hand delivered this lady to me. And he says, uh, you know, thank goodness that, that, that she's there because he needed that. I mean, he's, you know, pretty, pretty good sized business, 30 plus employees. They do a bunch of hardscapes and, uh, you know, he has to, he has to depend on somebody to help him actually run the business. So, um, you never know when something like that's going to happen, guys. And, and you need to have that staff in place to kind of help each other when, when something does uh, unfortunately happen like that. But add markup and determine your profit margin. Determine the right price based on these factors. And I keep stepping on my, my microphone, so sorry. I um, don't know what's going on with me here tonight. Um, but determine the right price based on these factors, your cost estimate, the customer needs and expectations, the local market, and your competition, and then your expected profit margin. And hopefully we never have to bid against those guys that'll do it for zero just to keep you from getting the job. And that still, I tell that story all the time. I just can't believe it. So other methods of estimating, conceptual estimate generally prepared by the architect using cost models from previous project. Guys, it's, it's easy to price a house over and over again. I mean, it, it really is. It's hard to price a landscape job. There's too many variables that we face. Yes, the, the, um, the, the GC and the architect, they got to deal with weather and stuff too. But you know what? Lumber is the price of lumber. And they come up with a general square foot price that they can give their clients. Hey, we, you know, we can build the house for $150 a square foot, 180, whatever it is, you know, depending on the size of it. Um, we could come up with possibly maybe a square foot method, and, and I'm sure a lot of you do for like retaining walls, uh, sod, mulch, things of that nature. But I don't think we're gonna give a conceptual estimate. You know, yes, we might can go by and look at a job and say, hey, well, I can do, I can do a good job if I have $10,000 on this job. But you know what? It might cost 15. But we can do that square foot. Yeah. What about unit price? Bundles, all cost factors such as labor, materials, equipment, and subcontractors uh, up with a unit price for the entire task. Um, preliminary estimates, quoting a price before you have a chance to make an accurate calculations is risky. Don't do it. I would never do it. Inaccurate estimates uh, can come from mathematical errors, omissions in labor or materials. Wow. It's, um, I'd rather leave out a little bit of labor than materials because I hate going to spend money for a, for a product that I'm having to give away. Uh, Non-standard abbreviations on the plan or whatever. And then units of measure. Guys, you need to be able to read a scale. You need to be able to look down and, and be able to read dimension lines and, and figure these plans out and accurately estimate these, these projects. Submitting your bid. Once your estimate is complete and you're ready to submit your bid, you make sure uh, to follow the instructions on the bid package. Guys, because if you're five minutes late, they're not going to accept it. They have timelines that they've got to meet too. They probably need to be sealed. The GC is going to open it up or the landscape architect if they're working for the, uh, for the homeowner. But you got to have a time and place to submit these uh, bids. 
Job cost recording. Current projects are monitored more closely with the cost tracking system. Cost overruns can be identified and corrective action taken a lot sooner. Information from a job cost uh, recording system helps with future estimates by creating more accurate unit costs. So if you use that, uh, you know, 10 pallets of sight, how long did it take you? Well, you kind of get the feel that you can do that over and over again for next jobs. If you got, but you got to have a way to track it and you got to keep up with it. Uh, many analytical reports can be generated from cost data to review performance by project, activity, year, etc. A cost code system should include the following components, a project number, the activity classifi uh, classification code, and a distribution code. So you can always go back and see what projects cost what, how many, how many units were used on this job, how, many la how much labor was, was taken for this particular job or task on this project. And I love the software programs that are out there now that will help you uh, do that. But technology uh, for estimating. Shorter time to prepare the estimate. You know, you, you've got a lot of these tasks already uploaded into your software system. It gives you improved accuracy. It gives you a professional presentation uh, to give to the customer. And then there are databases for unit cost items such as material and labor. It's all stored there. And a lot of these software programs are based, you know, subscription based. You're going to have to pay so much a month or so much a year uh, to have them. And, and guys, they're, they're, there's numerous, numerous uh, accounting softwares and estimating softwares uh, out there. We use Jobber. Uh, we use it every day in our business. We do our estimating. We do our scheduling. We do our billing. Uh, all that's handled with Jobber. And then Dad still uses, you know, QuickBooks for, for some of the things. I'm not a big QuickBooks guy, uh, to be honest with you, but I do love Jobber and, and what it's done for us. Multiple estimate report formats that you can present to the customer. There's a tracking method for historical information. There's the ability to recall and modify past projects. And then there's the job costing capabilities. What did it cost you? You've got that history that you can always go back and uh, look upon. So knowing what stage the project is in and preparing a proper type of cost estimate or bid are essential to an efficient operation. What stage is the project in? Well, guys, you're going to be bidding on these commercial jobs, um, you know, before they get started, to be honest with you. You know, if you're, if you're working for a residential builder, yeah, they may call you in at the last minute. Hey, we got one ready next week. Go get it done. But does the client want an estimate or a bid? What is the level of accuracy that the client is expecting? And so what is the difference between an estimate and a bid? Bid, you're kind of throwing something together. They're bidding on a bunch of, you're, you're bidding against other people. An estimate is, hey, we can do this for you for this price. I'd much rather give an estimate than a bid. Is the estimate required for cost comparisons? Now, that's the bid. Does the client just want a ballpark figure? Well, with time, with ex expertise and, and being in the business this long, guys, you can read a client pretty quick or a potential client. You're going to be able to tell if they have money right off the bat, pretty much in that initial phone call. And then you set up the, the first meeting with them. And you go over there and you do the estimate and you sit down at the kitchen table and you look around the house and there's no other furniture in the house, but they're wanting a price on an outdoor kitchen. Something's a little wrong there, right? So it's probably time to, to pack up and uh, head to the house. Estimates. A potential customer wants to know how much a project will cost to make a decision on whether to proceed to more detailed work. Simple as quoting a range of prices. Can it be based on unit cost for general types of materials? What about deck square footage, plant cost per tree, or fill dirt per cubic yard? All of these you kind of need to know uh, when going in to, uh, to bid this job. Use caution when preparing one. Avoid misunderstanding. Estimates are not firm prices. If converting an estimate to a contract, state that additional costs may be incurred. Again, an estimate is a estimate. It's not a sealed in stone price. Let them know that there may be some other things that could come up. You, you may not, you start digging in a yard and you may realize that uh, 
they need a whole lot more soil amending amendments uh, to to take care of the plant material you're getting ready to plant. All kinds of things can happen, guys. If the project has changed, unknown conditions are discovered, you need to have that in your contract and actually give them a copy of a change order that you have. Bidding. Formal proposals to clients in the form of bids serve as a prelude to a binding contract. Uh, prices should be carefully calculated. Be prepared to uphold the bid price if the contract is accepted. So once you do submit a bid to a GC and they accept it, you got yourself a contract right there going on. Bids are done for public and private projects. All potential contractors prepare design bids based on a common document. And hopefully you're bidding apples to apples. Hopefully they're closed specs that everything is laid out for you. So you are bidding uh, exactly what these other contractors are bidding on. The process typically begins with an advertisement. That's an invitation to bid. Uh, in the form of a written quest for qualifications. Now, you may need to be qualified. They, they may ask that you be licensed landscape contractors, and I've seen that on certain public jobs. They may request that you um, have financial statements submitted. There's all kinds of ways that they can qualify you to bid on this job. Um, and then they're going to ask the request for proposal. Advertisement information, where to obtain bid information materials, when and where the bid is to be submitted, and design professional will assess the bids and award the contracts. Calculating the project cost, skills needed to develop and calculate the cost of a project. Reading, interpreting specifications, drawings. You need, like I said, you need to be able to take a set of plans and figure it out. Research cost estimating sources. Experience from past projects is, is a wealth of knowledge. Understanding your workers and their ability to perform these jobs and then knowledge and work requirements for a particular geographic region. Well, if you're traveling out of state, um, you know, there may be different labor laws. There may be, <laughs> there's definitely gonna be different plant material. There's gonna be different stone, you know? Just like, you know, in Florida, it's hard to get hold of pea gravel and stepping stones because all of that stuff has to be hauled in. It costs a whole lot more down there than it does right here in North Carolina. Knowledge of the client, are they honest and trustworthy? Well, we hope so. And we try to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, but that sometimes can, uh, can bite us. Sources for preparing the project cost. Various resources are available to obtain prices for materials. I mean, guys, pick up the phone and, and call site one. Call your nurseryman. Call your greenhouse lady. You can get the prices uh, for, for our stuff pretty, pretty easily. Uh, labor and overhead needs to be calculated to prepare the estimate. Most effective is the contractor's own historical records. You know, that's why monotonous work makes money, right? You're doing the same type of work over and over again. Maintain your records for a time spent on each aspect of a project. Compile this data so you can prepare a base for concrete, forming concrete, performing a cleanup. A lot of this is gonna be the same. It's gonna take the same amount of time, same number of hours, same number of man hours. What are the cost of materials, equipment rented and time used, and special situations such as delays, site improvements, and extenuating circumstances. And guys, you could probably, if you're keeping a good track record, you could probably look back and say, hey, we had so many rainy days on a project that's a month long. You know, and yes, that's gonna change from year to year, but you've got some kind of historical data to base it on. If you're doing a 30 day job and it rains, you know, five days out of that, you need to calculate that you're gonna be on it 35 days, right? the next time. By keeping accurate records of previous projects, contractors can assemble unit costs. They can calculate labor, add material cost, and then divide by total units completed. Um, example, square footage of concrete. Submit a more accurate bid, allow the contractor to review worker productivity. Well, if you're comparing it to last jobs, you may hire some new people that aren't up to par. It may be time to replace them. Determine benefits of various construction techniques and then assess differences by project conditions. What to do if there is limited historical cost data? Refer to landscape construction cost reference guides, mean, suites, carry and dodge. The dodge room, remember those going to pick up the plans. Available as textbooks, some with software applications for estimating. Reference guide provide detailed breakdowns, material labor related costs. Cost adjustments may need to be made based on local conditions. 
and then potential cost influencers on projects, distance from the suppliers, availability of supplies, labor costs, insurance, and utility availability. And if you're working out of town, there may be other license that you may have to purchase, business license, they may require uh, additional insurance, all kinds of things happen when you're working uh, outside of your geographical location. So it's good to call ahead and see what other permits and insurance and stuff may be required. Regulatory influences on pricing, potential government regulations may affect project costs. Before preparing a bid, visit the local government officials or give them a call, pick up the phone. Uh, there's gonna be usage of local products, special regulations about work hours, limitations on plant removal and pruning. All this can take place, guys beforehand. You should know this before you actually bid on the job. Uh, the job. Local regulations may increase the cost. They more than likely are. And then projects funded with state and federal funding may have multiple regulations. And note these regulations in the project specifications. Components that are key when calculating costs. Accurate calculated estimates of materials required to build a project. Labor time of employees spent on installation. Labor can vary greatly uh, based on the type of operation or project, your overhead, non-labor and material costs, assignable or unassignable overhead, assignable, you can assign it to that particular job. So if you're having to get a job trailer, job site trailer, it's assigned to that job. The, the porta potty assigned to that job. Plan for contingency issue costs. And what about determine your desired profit? Again, that's going to vary from job to job. You want to be close. Um, as much as, as the previous job. But yes, sometimes it, uh, you may take less of a profit um, certain times of the year just because work gets slow. Material costs are calculated using the design prepared for the site, a material takeoff, calculation of quantities, use a method that interfaces with accounting department and track activities, will provide information valuable for current and future jobs, review the entire set of plans and specs to determine what needs to be done. What about the certain times? Contractor will be here on such and such date. Landscape contractor will install silt fencing by January 30th, 2020 for project so-and-so. Work done under certain circumstance and work performed by subcontractors must be determined up front. Nothing wrong with using subs. It just gives you a lot more paperwork and accountability uh, to keep up with, especially uh, on these larger projects. Careful reading of the project specs to determine quality and brand of materials. You may, they may uh, want Pine Hall brick, but you get it somewhere else because it's a little bit cheaper when they've specified we want the old town paver from Pine Hall brick. Where substitution may be proposed, substitutions require wit written approval from the client. They can save the contractor money and you must provide identical quality to the specified brand. Specifications will state or equal if substitutions are allowed Examples may be hardscape and irrigation materials and amenities and plant materials. And sometimes plant materials are going to be hard to find. So you may need to go back to the owner and the landscape architect and say, hey, we just can't find these this time of year. Can we substitute it for this? And a lot of times they're going to, they're going to, you know, they, they want to hear your expertise too. And, um, you know, just try it, you know, but I've heard nightmares, the landscape architect, nope, we're going to use this plant. I don't care what, but if you can't find it, you can't find it. Review the plans for errors and omissions. Errors are not opportunities to take advantage of. Specification will include a clause for the contractor to notify the client of any errors. The clause does not relieve the contractor of the responsibility. You are a licensed landscape contractor held accountable by the state of North Carolina with your bond. That's why they signed that power of attorney. They can enact a bond if you do not do right by your clients. Increase actual quantity of certain materials. When performing a material takeoff, accommodate any material loss 10 to 15%. Materials may settle during shipping. They may be blown away or eroded if they're loose and bulky. Common bulk materials or sand, soil, base material, and other granular products. Other materials to over order due to loss waste, unit pavers, wall materials, they're gonna break, stuff like that. Concrete, always about two to 3% to avoid a short load. Plant materials, over order up to 5% accommodate for plant mortality and waste, and then ground cover plants and even sod. Stockpiling common materials saves money. Regular installation of similar design elements, base materials, pavement, wall materials, lumber, mulch, definitely. 
if you're using a lot of pea gravel, brick chips, stuff like that, pine needles, having it on, on site and being able to take it to the job site with you uh, will help it. And it reduces storage space on these larger projects if you're taking the materials that you're working for that day. Calculating time required to install a project, one of the most difficult cost calculations. Experienced contractor calculates labor need with reasonable accuracy. Just Guys, it just happens with time. Unusual site conditions, unforeseen problems can be challenging even to the experienced contractor. And yes, it can be. Hours per unit, number of hours it takes a labor to complete a task. Units are measurable elements of work. Square feet of retainer wall, square, you know, a square of sod. Hours are based on one hour of worker's time. Hours per unit, review of the design, project design, the site, skill, and quality of labor. Now that quality of labor is something that's hard to keep up with now, ain't it? it, it I don't really, I don't know. I'm not going to talk bad about millennials. I mean, hell, we're responsible for them, aren't we? Overhead. Calculating an overhead cost is split into two categories. Assignable, unassignable, assignable. Non-labor, non-material cost directly associated with the project. Um, special permits, insurance, equipment rental, bonding, temporary utilities, related project activities. They are assignable overhead on the takeoff. Unassignable, cost of operating a business that are not project specific. Equipment, vehicles, gas, tools, you know, that's the super site super getting there. Insurance, payroll and expenses, debt, service and mortgage, office expenses, vacation, sick days, and many other expenses. Those add up. Recovering this unassignable overhead. Calculate the cost and then add them on per project basis. Establish an hourly rate for overhead to add to hourly labor costs. Hourly costs known as a multiplier. Calculate the total overhead per year in the reporting period and divide by the number of billed hours per client per year multiplier can be adjusted up or down. We should all know that, guys. And then when it comes to reducing overhead, improve the efficiency of your operations, the timing of installation to improve pricing, negotiate with manufacturers for warranties, work to reduce insurance premium, cost share specialty equipment with other contractors. They're going to tear it up and then send it to you for, for repair. Structure your business to take advantage of tax regulations and then have regular training programs to improve work or technical skill and performance. Taxes and fees, landscape contractors remain current in all applicable federal, state, and local taxes and fees. That's again being uh, a true business owner and being that licensed professional. Contingencies, reserve a portion of a project cost for unpredictable conditions. What can be unpredictable? Weather, material delays, labor shortages every single day, equipment breakdowns every single day, unknown underground obstructions. Typical contingency funds range from 5 to 10% of total project cost, usually included in the overhead multiplier. And this is another method that the client establishes. Um, another method is if a, if a client establishes a contingency fund if things run over. Profit, choice for determined profit, is a personal and business decision. Methods for calculating profit or margin, percentage of cost of labor and materials. Margin depends on the size of the project or demand for a service. So if you're in high demand, it's a lot higher. Materials can be marked up two to three times cost to cover overhead and profit. Labor costs are sometimes double. Profit expressed as a percentage of the total cost range from as low as three to four percent to high as 25 percent. And profit can be part of overhead or as a separate negotiable line item in the bid. Material labor takeoff form, utilize a computer spreadsheet format to itemize project costs. The form can be customized for individual business costs, list work, task, and materials, quantities, overages, unit costs, worker hours, hourly rates, and even additional billable costs. Performing the takeoff should follow the consistent pattern. Forms should be consistent. Use one side of the sheet to avoid a missed back page. Check the plans to ensure the scale is accurate. Uh, and has not been altered. Surely you, that's the first thing you check is the scale. And then when a plan has been estimated, mark it with a large X to avoid duplication. Always use highlighters and then use printed measurements over scaling or the dimension lines on the plan. Look for written notes and notations, NIC, not in contract. No price is needed. NTS, not to scale. Written dimensions must be obtained. Convert to decimals, but be consistent. Double check placement of decimal points and round only when calculating final figure. 
Presentation for uh, projects, methods to arrange various cost aspects of a bid, either lump sum, itemized, time and materials, cost plus fixed fee, unit cost, and pricing to a GC. All of these are ways that we can submit our bids or estimates uh, to get the work. Lump sum, all project costs are provided in a single number. Difficult to change due to no itemized labor and material costs. And add or deduction to the cost is more difficult to do. I don't like lump sum. Itemized has a detailed listing of project materials and tasks. Easily changed if adds or deductions happen and the prices can be shown by unit of work. Time and materials, good for when the amount of time to complete the work is considered. Provides a set price for materials and assignable later. Uh, materials and assignable overhead costs do not change significantly. Unassignable overhead, contingency and profit are assigned to employee hourly rates. I like time and materials, to be honest with you. You're going to get your money um, and you're not going to be able to leave anything out. Cost plus fixed fee, I like that too. When uncertainty exists on time required to complete a project, time and materials bid with profit listed as a fixed line item, client is not responsible for additional profit as a result of delayed completion. Unassignable overhead and contingency costs remain assigned to the employee hourly rate. Unit cost, estimating tool used to provide general project costs. Costs are presented by units of work areas or by the square footage. Requires tracking of previous jobs. Costs can be tracked over several projects to obtain more accurate estimates. And then pricing to the GC. Contractors often serve as subcontractors for a portion of the project. We are if we're working on the large sites. We must supply price of work. Required formal written proposal. And typical formats include lump sum and itemized bids. And a lot of times they're going to just want you to give that lump sum bid. Now, like I said, I don't like it, but sometimes it's the best thing to do. Uh, and just think for pine needles, you know, on a residential yard, how much you get per bale, how much you get per bale. You know, people want to see that you're putting it out for $5 when you pay $4.50 or $5 for the bale anyway. Uh, and then you got these guys driving through neighborhoods doing it for absolutely nothing, but we just give a flat fee. You know, we'll pine needle your yard for X amount of dollars. Well, how many bales it takes? No, we don't do it by, by the bale. We do it price per job because if, the, if you price it and it's 50 bales, they're going to want to count 50 bales. You may only use 45. They're going to want to subtract it. Or what if it does go over? I just don't like them knowing my price per bale. Anyway, guys, I appreciate it. Hopefully this helped. I know it was kind of dry a little bit. It does get a little boring talking about uh, writing all these contracts, but it is information that we need to know. So, guys, I appreciate it. My name is Eric Jones, turf teacher, and I'll see you in the next lecture.